So, um, Brett Bedan drives a 26 car. I remember this because uh, it was just, you ain't going to feel this way because you were living it and working on this car, but this was an upset. Um, you know, r- regardless of the success of the 26 car with uh, Ricky Rudd in previous years, uh, you and Brett, the team was kind of having an up and down year, but y'all go to North Wiltsboro and just destroyed everybody. Um, I was I, I experienced this from the paddock area on top of a Comfort Coach van, and all of the kids of the drivers and crew chiefs all sat on top of these vans. So I'm sitting on my van with Brad Means, Jimmy Means' son. Uh, Ten feet away is Heidi Bodine, Brett's daughter, and uh, and Barry and all of them from Jeff. Uh, and man, we didn't, we, we were always winning and running good and here, here they are destroying us. And that was probably the minute when, that was probably the moment where, uh, I recognized you, uh, I guess for your talent and your ability, Brett's a great driver i mean i'd seen we'd seen him racing the sportsman series driving for my granddaddy and and the 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 thomas brothers country ham car and just having all kinds of good success there and knew he was a driver but nobody goes to wiltsboro and destroys the field like that i mean um do you even think about that race does this even rank up in any kind of uh moment in your career but for me it's a it's a standout moment for you uh for me it's a it's a moment where you kind of checked all the boxes which led to your ascension into the yates program yeah yeah it, it was because a it was my first oval track win you know you you go to watkins Glen, you know what you should win with ricky rudd mm-hmm. you go to oh, sonoma yeah. road course you should win with ricky rudd mm. just make sure the eyes are dotted and the t's are crossed but Wilkesboro hadn't qualified that good, but there was something about that car in final practice Saturday afternoon. I stood down in the corner, garage was down in one and two, and that thing would turn before it would get to the center of the corner. And you could just see that thing squat and take that bite off the corner. It's doing the same thing down three and four. And I knew as we made about a 30 lap run in final practice, thinking to myself and looked at the stopwatch, I said, I, I don't know what he's feeling. I didn't talk to him, let him make his run. I don't know what we could change on this thing. And he made that 30-lap run. He pulled it in the garage area. He said, we'll change something if you want, but I swear to God, I don't mm. know what to tell you to change on it. I said, I see the same thing. Let's get it ready to race. And, you know, there was the scoring issue that DW is still mad about, yeah. even today. Well, explain what, that. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, because I don't even know the nothing, call. Probably. We had made a green flag pit stop, as others had. And in the middle of those green flag pit stops – the caution came, and you didn't have electronic scoring. It was it was men and women in a scoring stand right. with with pad and paper. Paper, that's keep, right. Keeping scoring. So the pace car picked us up, but it actually had us a lap on the field. Right. Well, I knew that wasn't right. I felt like we were still leading the race because most of the leaders had pitted, and and. We had made up so much ground on those fresh tires. So when the pace car picked us up, you know, everybody pitted again. And Brett's raising cane. We, I think we ran 30-something laps of caution trying to sort this scoring deal out. And finally, <laughs> they came and said, 26 cars a leader. And Brett's raising cane on the radio. I said, stop. I don't know what else to do for you, man. You got four fresh tires, and you're the leader of the race. Right. I got nothing more for you. Yeah. DW was upset. He'd still bring it up even to me after we started doing the Fox deal. I said, look, you had 60 laps to get by us, and you couldn't do it. Oh. So, <laughs> not what he wanted he to hear. He thought he was the leader? He did. He thought we were a and, lap and, down. And we actually – they had us a lap on the field. We should have just been the leader. Leader. Yeah. You know, on the lead. Sure, down. he thought you were a lap down. Yes. Y'all feels in my in my mind, it seems like y'all led that whole race pretty much. We we did lead quite a bit. We yeah. did lead quite a bit, but the whole snafu was that caution that fell in the middle of green sox, flag cycle pit stops with no electronic score, and it it was a dumpster fire. So is that? Um, did you start getting phone calls at the at the during that year, like immediately after that, or when when did things start? taking off for you to to make a change so actually at the end of 89 
Robert and Davy s- sniffed that Rudd was going to be leaving. Yeah. And I had went and met with them in the front of their hauler at the Phoenix race at the end of 89. Okay. And it's a little embarrassing, but I shook Robert's hand and, and took a deal for 1990 to go do the 28 car. Mm. And we went to – there used to be an off week between Phoenix and Atlanta, and we went down and tested Atlanta during the off weekend. And I couldn't get this off my mind. I just, I just wasn't happy with my decision. Not because of going to work with Robert Yates and Davey Allison, but my, my commitment to Kenny Bernstein. Yeah. This man had given me a chance that nobody else sure. would have. I'd built this team pretty much from the very beginning, and I just was getting cold feet. So I remember during lunch one day at the test going across the street to the 7-Eleven to a payphone and calling Robert, and I say, I know you're going to think I'm not very much of a man because I know I shook your hand, but I can't do it, and here's why. And he said, Larry, I'm not happy, but I totally respect where you're coming from. You, you need to be commended for what, what you're actually doing here. Yeah. So I stayed with the 26 car through the 90 season, Started the '91 season and and it was hit and miss, Dale. We you know it's like we could get the we could get the car good and we the engine was not where it should be. We just it's like we just couldn't connect all these dots consistently. Mm-hmm. So we go to Atlanta, third or fourth race of of '91, set on the outside the front row, and we only got about twenty or thirty laps run because the rain moved in. But Davy had crashed real early. And Jake Elder, who was a crew chief, refused to fix the car. They loaded it up and came home. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Just that just was Jake. Yeah. <laughs> so Still. we go back racing on Monday <laughs> and we blew up 20, 30 laps, running well inside the top five. We blew up 30, 40 laps into the race, restarting. So Linda and at that time our two kids, we were in the minivan driving home. I bet you Linda and I didn't say five words to each other driving home. Wasn't that I was mad at her. Sure. I just, just like, what in, in the yeah. hell? So we get home, and her and the kids go inside. I knew Bernstein was going to be calling me. And it didn't matter if we wrecked, if we blew up, if the gear tore up. I, I was the whipping child yeah. for Kenny. And I knew he was going to be calling. Because, again, he didn't get to go to that many races sure. because of drag racing. So we get home. I start unloading the van. I said, Linda, if anybody calls, I'm not here. I don't want to deal with it today. So I'm unloading the van. I heard the phone ring. I'm out in the garage, and she come, came to the door and said, telephone, Larry. It's like, really? She said, <laughs> you might want to take this call. So I answered, Larry Mack, Robert Yates. He said, I know where you stand. I know where you're at, but I'm going to make a crew chief change in the morning, and I just want to know, is there any possibility – your interest is. Mm. I said, when and where do you want to mm. meet? We met at the Waffle House down on, down on Sunset Boulevard, <laughs> sat there from about 10 o'clock that night to 4 in the morning on wow. Monday, on Tuesday morning and struck a deal. That's how you do it. <laughs> Waffle House. As anyone it's a wonder they all night they, 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 they didn't run, me out, run us out of there because we've been sitting there all night long. An all-nighter at Waffle House. <laughs> Scattered, smothered. Covered, chunked. <laughs> That's a great way to end this conversation. Well, it's a great way to pause the conversation yeah. until next time because we've got a. Uh, th- that's yeah. We knew that this was just so much going on here that we wanted so to tackle into. Yeah. But that was that's an amazing first half of your career right there. I guess is a good way to put yeah, it. Yeah, are we and, even halfway? I, I, yeah, <laughs> the first yeah. Well. I appreciate you uh, diving into the history there, and and we want to get you back on the show, and obviously go through Davy and and the rest of the things that you went you got going on all the way up until what you're doing today as as a as an analyst and uh, for Fox. But uh, that that's pretty amazing, man. To learn that's part of your the I mean I know you from um, from my knowledge of being around the sport, but what you told us today is something I did not know about you, something I'd not be able to learn only from you yourself uh, is how you got started. Uh, Pretty phenomenal story. Um, We appreciate you giving us some time to come tell it today, and we'll be in touch with you to try to get you back on here as soon as we can to finish this out. I'd love to come back and tell the rest of the story. I I, I love this show you're doing, and you know the biggest thing I want to share with you is that this this is – that's not 61 years old. That's two years of working with the Intimidator right there. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. 
listen, if you've watched that video but haven't checked out our podcast, what are you waiting for? The Dell Gym Download is available for free on major podcast platforms. 